This dualism was also, as it was mentioned, was adopted by Christianity, where you have like you know Satan, you know they have they consider something evil and, and something good. Islam also adopted the Christian view, I guess, model of Satan. So, is is it considered is it considered the vote Zara to believe in more than one God, or in let's say you don't believe in that you believe in the existence of them, but you only serve one of them or only see one of them as good, like Zoroastrianism, how, what is the definition that makes it about Zara? Well, uh, you know, the idea is that uh, you have to believe that, um, that there is only one God that is supreme over every other power in the universe. Uh, there can be, theoretically, the acknowledgement of other powers, mm -hmm. but those powers are subordinate, and uh, God can withdraw their power at any given moment. So I wouldn't say that the Christian idea of Satan is per se a bodhisattva. There are other aspects of Christianity that are idolatry, uh, such as the Trinity and uh, the notion of God uh, being corporeal, meaning having the attributes of a physical body. Uh, the issue of Satan, I would say, might be a mistaken idea, but it wouldn't automatically be an idolatrous idea. Now, with the Rasterism, I mean, they were positing literally the god of darkness, the force of darkness, the force of, e uh, force of goodness. These were two competing equal powers that one time, sometimes one wins, sometimes the other wins. So that certainly would be, would be idolatrous in that, that way. Now, you'll re recall, although it's not our, our really subject for now, that uh, there is a bi very big machlokas among the Rishonim if Christianity is Avodah Zara for, for the Gentiles. There is a sheet of Rabbeinu Tam although they're different interpretations, who actually mm -hmm. says that uh, Christianity is not a violation of idolatry under the seven Noahide laws, although it would be idolatry for a Jewish person to affirm it. Now, that doesn't mean, obviously, that it's correct for Gentiles. I mean, it can't be correct for Goyim and incorrect for Jews, but it means that it's within the range of permissible mistakes that would not be tainted with idolatry. Now, that's a machlokas. Uh, the Rambam actually says in a censored passage that Christianity, which this is pre-Reformation, so the Rambam was referring probably to a Coptic uh, Christianity, which was practiced in Egypt, or may, maybe even Roman Catholicism. Uh, but the Rambam does say it is idolatrous. Uh, but everybody admits that Islam is not an idolatrous religion. We have many problems with Islam, uh, to be sure. And the Rambam talks about uh, Mohammed the Meshuga, Mohammed the crazy one, who has done worse for the Jews than any other nation that ever lived. But uh, the one thing in their favor is they are not technically Ovde Avodazara. Uh, yeah. Why wasn't the Torah given at the beginning of creation? Yeah, so that's a very interesting question. Why was the Torah not given at the very beginning of creation if indeed Hashem created the universe? for the purpose of the Jewish people keeping the Torah, or, or some nation keeping the Torah, then why did so many generations, 25 generations, uh, go through the world until we have a, a Torah itself? So the truth of the matter is, uh, the Torah was always part of the legacy of the righteous. We are told that the Avos, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, were able to perceive the Torah as part of the spiritual DNA of the universe. Uh, what you're talking about is not that there was no Torah until Revelation, but rather there was no open mandatory Revelation, meaning to say, as the generations got worse and worse and spiritually inferior, they could no longer trust their intuition, they could no longer trust their reason, they could no longer trust their judgment to ascertain what the will of God was, so it had to be concretized in the form of definitive Commandments. Now, Rav Chaim Volozhner in the Nefesh Shachayim makes a point which it's not entirely clear what he means, but uh, he may be suggesting a very daring point. You know, one of the famous discussions in rabbinic literature is this idea that the Avos kept the whole Torah before it was given, and yet we find that the Avos seemingly violated a lot of the Torah. So Yaakov married two sisters, right? Things like that or the Shvatim married their twin sisters and the like. And if you simply give an answer, well, that's before the Torah was given, but that doesn't suffice because the Avos kept the Torah before it was given. Many, many, many answers. One is the Ramban's thesis that before Matan Torah, 
The Avos only kept the Torah in Eretz Yisrael. They didn't keep the Torah in Chutz Laaretz. Maral says they only kept the positive commandments, not the negative commandments. Different answers. Uh, but Rav Chaim Belashner suggests the following. Rav Chaim Belashner suggests that when the Torah did not exist in a mandatory level, then although it was the ideal way of life, it was possible for individuals to improvise when they determined that this was not the optimal spiritual path. So, for example, yeah, there's a law in the Torah that you're not supposed to marry two sisters, but Yaakov intuited that if it's Rachel and Leah, there was a higher spiritual purpose in doing so, that the spiritual world would be enhanced by the violation of that halacha. So he was able to determine that under such a situation, uh, the Torah didn't have to be kept. So Rav Chaim Voloshner says, that type of judgment could only exist before the Torah became mandatory. Once the Torah was given as a command, it no longer had the flexibility to be discarded for unusual circumstances. Again, Rav Chaim doesn't mention it, but obviously he is really addressing a certain theme of Hasidic thought, in which early Hasidists sometimes taught that if you could achieve a higher spiritual goal by, let's say, not saying Shema in time, right? Let's say it's an example. Let's assume Zaman Kriya Shema, the end of the Shema of the morning is at 9 o'clock in the morning, or now it's around 8, 8.25 in the morning. And you're still very tired at 8.25. And you could say, you know, so I'll get, I'll get up at 7.30 and dive, and it's going to be superficial. I'm not going to express my love of God. I tell you what, if I sleep until 10, I will have so much kavana. Isn't that more important? Isn't the subjective religious experience more important than complying with a technical rule? Well, early Hasidists sometimes said that. Rav Chaim Volezhner says, no, God says what you've got to do, and your individual judgment as to what is best doesn't count. But says Rav Chaim, before the Torah was given, that's exactly how the Avos functioned. They functioned on a certain subjective level in which the Torah was the norm, but they could make accommodations and exceptions if, on their understanding, a higher spiritual purpose would be achieved. That's a very amazing thought, actually. And what is a little uncertain is, is Rav Chaim suggesting the following idea. Is Rav Chaim suggesting that in point of fact, it may still be the case that sometimes violating the Torah might achieve a higher spiritual goal, but we are not inspired and understanding enough to be able to make that judgment. So the Torah operates based on the law of averages. That for most people, most of the time, this is the way it has to be. Maybe for you, it didn't have to be that way, but you're not in a position to make that judgment. That's a pretty amazing thing, uh, because Rav Chaim might be suggesting, and okay, maybe I shouldn't say this when I'm being recorded, Rav Chaim might be suggesting that in a purely objective way, there may be people, and there may be situations who they would be better served by a system that's a little different. But Hashem says only the Avos could make judgments like that. And if you're not the Avos, you can't make that judgment. Because we make judgments based on biases. We make judgments based on taiva. We make judgments based on Yetzir Hara. So our judgments that the Torah doesn't apply to me is always going to be off. But, Rav Chaim is suggesting, the theoretical possibility may in fact exist. In other words, it's a theoretical possibility that no one is allowed to do. Now that's a very different perspective than saying the Torah is an absolutely perfect fit for everybody. Rav Chaim might be intimating it's not always a perfect fit, but it's the best that is possible in a world where we don't have the closeness to Hashem to be able to determine our custom-made relationship with Hashem. Now maybe I'm reading too much of the Nefesh Chaim, but I, I think Nefesh Chaim might be saying something which is actually a surprisingly daring, daring statement. Uh, yeah? The Gemara in Yavali says that as a knas, 
for the Lulim, he didn't come at the beginning of the, the first order. Yeah. That, that the classes that were in Mike's original exclusively to, to the Kohanim, does that class still apply this moment there? Can I give a Rabbi Makabo or Mike's original? Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, just to familiarize people with the sugi. We know that the Torah says <coughs> that when you separate truma, you give the truma to a Kohen, and uh, the Maser Rishon, the 10% of the crop, uh, you give to the Levi. And Doraisa, you could give it to a Kohen as well, because Doraisa, a Kohen, is a Levi. But uh, you can give it to a Levi that's not a Kohen. Now, when the Jews returned to Eretz Israel after the 70 years of the Babylonian exile, first under Zerubbabel, right? That's in, in Moe's Sur, we talk about Kate's Bavel, Zerubbabel. Right, some reason, kids like to laugh at that. The alliteration is, is cute. Uh, but Zerubbabel was the first governor of the, of the Jewish community when we returned from Bavel, and only a small group of Jews came, 40,000 altogether, and it's estimated that's around between 1% and 10% of the population uh, of the Jewish people. Uh, and uh, then Ezra came a little later, after the, sec after the Beis HaMikdash was built, uh, and in both, there were very, very few Levium. Uh, there were more Kohanim than Levium, which is strange because there's supposed to be more Levium than Kohanim. And because of this, the Gemara says, Ezra made a kanas. Ezra wanted to punish the tribe of Levi by providing that instead of giving the Maser Rishon to a Levi, you give a Maser Rishon to the Kohen. Now, Kohanim were not so great in showing up either, but proportionally, more Kohanim did come uh, than Levium. Now, again, Ezra is not violating the Torah because Doraisa, a Kohen, is also a Levi. So it's okay, but he did make a Gezerah or a Takana not to give it to a Kohen. I'm, I'm sorry, not to give Maser Rishon to a Levi because of a Kanas. So the question that was raised is that if you're a Levi, uh, does that apply even today? I mean, uh, you're, uh, right, and, and uh, must I give my Maser Rishon uh, only to a Kohen, or can I give my Maser Rishon to a Levi? So first, I think I want to step back a little bit and say, are you, do you give Maser Rishon to anybody? Because again, if any of you have experience in separating Trumos and Masros, uh, you will know that for the most part, we separate things and we don't give them to anybody. We throw them away, we wrap them up in plastic and throw them away. So let me explain a little background about that. How does Nasina work today? Hafrasha, you do have to separate. Otherwise, it's Tevel. And if you get something under Hashkacha, they already did it for you. But if you did it yourself, now Shemitah, by the way, there is, Shemitah, there is no Trumas and Masra. So this year, you don't have a, a worry about it, but otherwise, you would. So let's go over each item. Truma today, uh, a Kohen is not allowed to eat because Truma cannot be eaten in a state of Tuma. And everybody is in a state of Tuma today because if we've ever been in a cemetery, we're Tame until we're purified with the ashes of the Paradum, which we don't have. So as a result, there's no way a Kohen can eat Truma. But that doesn't end the question. Okay, a Kohen can't eat Truma. But so what? The halacha is a Kohen can use Tame Truma, or if he's tame, he can use it to feed to his animal or the like. So just because the Kohen cannot eat it, both because, actually there are two reasons a Kohen can't eat it. A Kohen can't eat it because he's tame, and a Kohen can't eat it because it's tame. Either way. But that's not an exemption in Nasina. So why don't we give, why don't we give Truma to a Kohen? So the truth of the matter is, the main reason we don't give Truma to a Kohen today uh, is that uh, Kohen is not able to prove his yichus as a Kohen beyond a doubt. Uh, because every Kohen today is really a Suffolk Kohen. And as a result, Hamotzi Michavero Alof Haraya, I'm not obligated to give Truma to somebody who cannot prove he's definitively a Kohen. Now, let's talk about Maser Rishon. Maser Rishon being Tame, or the Levi being Tame, is actually not a problem. Because a Levi can eat Maser Rishon Betuma. And by that I mean a Levi can eat Maser Rishon that is Tame. And a Levi can eat Maser Rishon if he's Tame. 
So the only reason why there may be a svara that I don't have to give Maser Rishon to a Levi is because of the same idea, Hamotzi Michavero Alav Haraya. Of course, there's another issue as well, meaning if, if someone is claiming he's a Levi uh, and he therefore he wants my Maser Rishon, I can say you cannot prove you're a Levi and therefore I'm not Mechayiv to give it to you. Now, if I want to give it, is there any downside in my wanting to give it to someone that's a Levi? <coughs> but Pashtas, there would be no downside. So the result would be, this is all an introduction to your question, that I would be allowed to give my Maiser Rishon to a Levi, even though I would not be obligated to give it to a Levi, because a Levi can't prove his status. So the question then becomes, if out of the kindness of my heart, uh, I want to give my Maiser Rishon to a Levi, do I have to give it to a Kohen, or can I give it to a Levi? So that's a good question. I, I, I see two svaras for that. Svara number one is that once you're giving the Maser Rishon, you must give the Maser Rishon in accordance with the Takana of Ezra. And if the Takana of Ezra is to give it to a Kohen, you'd have to give it to a Kohen. But I'll give you a svara number two. If svara number two says, I don't have to give it to anybody because Hamotzi Mechaber of Haraya, at that point, you can't possibly tell me the Takana of Ezra says it has to go to a Kohen because I can respond, I don't have to give it to anybody. So in a situation where Me'ikar Hadin, you are totally exempt from having to give it, it would appear that you could choose to give it to a Kohen or a Levi. And I believe that that's how we paskin that. If one who is machmir to give Maser Rishon today is allowed to give it to a Levi because he has the option of not giving it to anybody. And therefore, it's not Shaykh as a Kodesh Ezra in such a situation. Yeah? It seems like sometimes it's very hard to remember things that I learned in class like how many it was. So what are some tips to improve? Yeah, yeah. The question is that it's so hard to remember uh, things that, that we learn. Are there any tips for uh, remembering? I, I, I wish I, I had them. Uh, it's a good, you know, this is a big frustration. I, I remember... I've mentioned this before that uh, many years ago I was offered to talk to Yaakov Kamineski for, uh, for a few hours, really amazing, amazing amount of time that he gave me. And uh, we were talking about different things. Uh, and one of the things he mentioned to me is that many people can be learning for many years even and they don't get a lot of satisfaction uh, in their learning. And he said the main reason is because they don't remember what they learned. And as a result, they don't have the satisfaction of mastering something. It's not so much covering ground. Some people say, oh, I don't feel uh, satisfied because I didn't learn many, many blot. Rav Yaakov says that's not it. Even if you only learned 20 blot, but you really, really knew it well, you would have a great, great sense of accomplishment. Accomplishment comes from a sense of mastery. Of course, we never master the Torah totally. There's always so many levels uh, that we don't fully understand. But if a person feels I have a solid, solid knowledge of things, I remember what I learned, that gives a person a lot of satisfaction. And that encourages you to keep on learning because you have a sense of knowing what you've learned. So the standard uh, way in which you kind of uh, keep your retention up is by reviewing a lot. And we sometimes don't like to review. We want to go on to something new. But Chazare is really the, uh, the, the only key to do it. But the Chazara shouldn't just be you read over the same stuff again and again. You have to think of different ways of reviewing. For example, taking notes, making notes, making charts, uh, writing up the Gemara in your own words. See, on one hand, people think, oh, isn't it better to kind of know what the Gemara says in the words of the Gemara? The truth is, not necessarily. Sometimes when you put it in your own words, it remains more in your, in your heart and, and, and the like. Uh, so uh, I would say Chazara, making notes, doing charts, uh, putting things in your own words. Also, uh, when you learn a complicated sugya, and you, know, you have ins and outs and ins and outs and ins and outs, you sometimes have to sit back and ask yourself, what do I take away from this? This is a real big problem because a lot of times you can know every step in a discussion. You can actually follow every step in the discussion, but you still have no idea what the discussion is about. 
It's like, I know this, and I know this, and I know this, and I know this. What do I know from this sugya? What knowledge do I take out? You understand what I'm saying? In other words, you ask yourself generally, what is it that I know, and what is it that I don't know? What is it that is still confusing? That's very important, because if you leave a sugya in a state of mental fog, I'm just confused. You're not going to remember anything. But if you think about what exactly is it that I don't know, that'll help you a lot because then you can say, I do know a lot of things here. I know ten things from this sugya. And there are five things I don't know. Okay, five things I don't know. I'll find it out eventually. You see the difference. There's a big difference between being confused and being able to pinpoint what it is that you don't know. When you pinpoint what it is you don't know, you can go on. In fact, when you're learning, you know, you don't have to answer every question. You can leave a sugya with a lot of questions. But you can't leave the sugya till you know what your questions are. When you know what it is you don't know, put it in a notebook. You can say, things I don't understand. Keep it in a notebook, and then go write or then go on. And you'll find as you learn more and more, some of those questions are going to be answered by themselves. Sometimes the question will be asked by the Gemara, two blot ahead, whatever it would be. But my point is, don't leave in a state of befuddle, general befuddlement. Uh, let your befud befuddlement be as specific as it can be. Because when you pinpoint it, you can then say, okay, I got ten things from this Gemara, even though there's a lot of stuff I don't understand. Okay, and, and then you'll remember it better. You'll remember it better. You'll remember it better. And um, I would tell you, too, that, you know, concentrate on the forest and not only the trees. Try to understand the general idea here. You know, uh, when I was, I'm not saying it's transferable necessarily, but when I taught uh, law school, so I don't know if, you ever, if you've ever seen a uh, legal casebook, whatever it is, if you've ever seen a law, law book. So the thing about law books is they have very, very detailed table of contents. They kind of break you know, everything into headings and subheadings and subheadings and subheadings. Now, it's only a table of contents. It doesn't really give you the, all the stuff. But people would sometimes ask me, what's a good advice to study for a test? And I told them, study the table of contents. Mm -hmm. Because you've got to get structure. You've got to get where things are moving. When you have structure, when you have a map, then details fit. You know where the details go. The details come. Same thing with halacha. You know, you learn Mishnah Brura, or any, any Sefer halacha, really, and there's like hundreds of rules. Now, most it depends on the person's mind, but many people have difficulty. How do you remember a hundred rules? But if you understand that the hundred rules actually come, let's say, let's say, from five or ten principles, and once you know the principle, then the rule will simply come from the principle. Then you don't have to memorize a hundred things anymore. You only have to memorize or understand five things. So part of learning is to try to see the general rules that come. And don't necessarily think at this point that you're going to be able to memorize every one of the, the details. Okay, I don't know if it helps about something to think about. Yeah. Um, so I have a question regarding Kolisha. Yeah. Um, so so back when the this was the Zero was made, like they had, uh, like singing was more like unidimensional. Like there was a type of like something clearly recognizable as singing, and it was prohibited because it was like arousing <coughs> or whatever. Nowadays. Uh, with certain styles, let's say, if a woman is rapping, or even more extreme, if like a woman is like shouting like in punk music, or, or growling or screaming in metal, uh, or like something that's clearly like, this is not an arousing thing, yeah. is that, is, does that still fall under the, under Kolisha? And as a quick aside, I recently heard uh, that Kolisha only applies uh, when it's a one-on-one -on -one encounter, so like a concert would be excluded, is that Right, so, so, so let me talk about Kalisha a little bit to give people some background. First, you know, what you just said there reminds me, uh, when I was um, engaged uh, to my, to my uh, present wife, uh, so we were in a restaurant in New York, 
and uh, there was a Japanese woman that was uh, started singing. And there was a mashkiach, a Haredi guy, you know, a frum guy. So I went over to the guy and said, you know, it's a, this is a, supposed to be a frum restaurant, a glad kosher restaurant. Like, what's going on? <laughs> so, Kalisha. So he said, uh, in Yiddish, he says to me, Nish can call, nish can isha. Uh, meaning, no, no voice, no woman. He said, <laughs> it doesn't count. There's no, there's no, there's no Kalisha Bechlau. But okay. Um, now, <coughs> first of all, let me point out a very interesting thing. There are two different halachas about Kalisha. One is in Arachayim, and one is in Eben Ha'ezer. Two different laws. Law number one about Kolisha is that in the presence of a woman singing, now I know that you asked, that's the definition of that, but in the presence of a woman singing, you are not allowed to say Shema, to say Brachos, or to learn Torah. And that Isser is very strong. That's even if it's your own wife or your own daughter, in which there's no Isser to hear her voice. There's an Isser in Hilchais Kriya Shema and Tefillah and Brachos, and Talmud Torah that you're not allowed to learn in the presence of a woman's singing voice. That is halacha number one of Kolisha. Now, according to some Rishonim, which we don't paskin like, but be aware of it, that's the only halacha of Kolisha. According to those Rishonim, if you're not learning, saying brachos or davening, I could go, you know, to a rock concert and, and listen to a woman sing. Now, we don't paskin that. We do not paskin that way. Be sure you underscore that. <coughs> because we have another halacha in Evan Hoezer, which basically says it is forbidden to listen to the singing of a woman's voice because it's sexually arousing. But that law has a number of exceptions. I can listen to my wife singing, etc. Uh, I can listen to my daughter, machlokas by sister. Okay, I, don't, I don't want to go into all the details at that point. So be sure you understand <coughs> that there are two different halachas of Kolisha. One is a halacha that pertains to Kriya Shema, Tefillah, Talmud Torah, and Brachos. And the other pertains to the general iser of listening to a woman singing because it is improperly sexually arousing. By the way, uh, the problem of the first Kolisha could really be very amazing. Am I allowed to sing Zemiros with my wife? just my wife. Now, I don't have an issue to hear my wife sing. That's permitted. But if Zemiros are Divrei Torah or Tefillah, then how am I allowed to do it? So Rebbe Yashav actually said, <laughs> Yashav was very strict. He said, <coughs> if your wife really wants to sing Zemiros, you have to let her sing solo and you can learn without, uh, without moving your lips. Meaning uh, the Yisra of Talmud Torah in front of a kolish is only bedibor, not behirur. So you can have your gemara there, you could think in learning, and let your wife sing solo. Uh, that's a pretty strict position. Uh, most poskim say, huh? No, I'll, I'll get to that. That's a separate, that's, that's a separate issue. I'm, I'm, I'm just talking about uh, one, even one woman. Uh, so that's another machlokas. But many poskim say that even ishto nida, uh, you can listen to your wife sing. Uh, now, most poskim say Zemiros is not a problem because Zemiros uh, is not considered within the category of brachos, tefillah, or divrei Torah. It's, it's um, more generic, and it would be much... Okay, that's the Gabi Zemiros. Now, the Isra of Kol Isha, both types, so the question becomes, uh, number one, uh, is different types of shouting or chanting... Uh, what, I mean, remember, a woman's spoken voice, Stam, a woman's giving a speech, uh, we, po we posken at least, that's not kolisha. It has to be a musical sound. So the question is, what is a musical sound? So the truth is, there is a tshuva from Rav Yaakov Emden, that Rav Yaakov Emden apparently was talking about the fact that uh, when people like sailors or something, when they, would, when, when they would be schlepping a boat, they'd be dragging, you know the way they used to have uh, boats and uh, they would pull with ropes and they would, uh, I don't know exactly why women were pulling the boat, but they'd be pulling the boat and they would have some type of chant to kind of kill time while they were doing it. And Rebecca Vemden says, uh, that's not musical and the like. So there, there is such a svara in the chuvos that some things are not singing. Certainly shouting is not music. Uh, rap may not be music, and indeed, I, I have actually seen religious organizations, although I can't bring a proof from them, that have employed uh, female rapping 
so to speak, in mixed groups, claiming mm, whatever. Okay. So all I'm saying is that your point is a good point, but it's hard to apply Lamaisa, so it's better to avoid anything that has kind of a musical, rhythmic quality. Pure shouting, Einachinami, would, would be much. I mean, assuming you're allowed to be in a place that's doing that type of music. That's a separate issue. There's other issues. There's sneas. There's all sorts of things going on. Now, the issue of... Um, there are other issues of Kolisha. Uh, one is the issue of multiple singing and mixed voices. Let's assume that you have more than one woman singing, and let, or let's assume you have men and women singing. The Gemara in Rosh Hashanah and Megillah talks about the idea of tre koli lo mishtami, that when two voices are going on, you're not really focused in any one of the voices. And some have used that as a heter of kolisha in a group, both in terms of zemiros and benching, and in terms of being able to listen. Uh, so choral music would be permitted. Now, this position is commonly stated in the name of the Sri Dei Esh. Sri Dei Esh was a very, very interesting gadol. He died in the uh, late 1960s. Rabbi Yechiel Yaakov Weinberg, uh, who was very unusual. He was, on one hand, a very close Talmud of the altar of Slobodka, but he also was educated in universities, and he spent part of his life in Germany. Then he was in the Warsaw Ghetto. At the end of the war, he went to Switzerland, and he died in Switzerland. Uh, he was considered to be a very, very great posek, but he was very lenient on a lot of issues. And in particular, it's important to point out that the leniency of the Sri Dayesh of Trey Kolilo Mishtame was dealing with a very specific situation. I, I want to show you how people abused the Sri Dayesh, etc. He was dealing, you know, when he came to Germany from Lita, he was really uh, encountering a totally different world. The Litvisha world that he came from were people that were learning Yom Valila. There was no secular education. There was no mixing of boys and girls. He comes to Germany, and like everything is different. Everyone's going to college, and this and that. And at first, he writes, at first, he couldn't be this. All he saw was how this was a place without religious standards. But then he understood that for this generation, this was something very good. So one of the things that he encountered in uh, Germany that he had not seen in Lithuania was a group that was called Ezra. Now, Ezra was mamish like NCSY today. NCSY, if anyone is familiar with NCSY. So you have boys and girls together, and they sing together, and uh, they do all sorts of stuff together. Uh, they try, at least, to keep uh, no, no nagia, you know, whatever it is, but Kolisha, for sure, goes out the window. Uh, the boys and the girls are singing and the like. And that's what this group was doing. And Rav Yechiel Yaakov Weinberg matured the mixed singing because of Trey Koli Lo Mishtame, but it was very clear that the reason for his heter was that this was an important stepping stone in bringing Jewish teenagers to mitzvos and to Torah and to Avodah Hashem. And if you were to simply tell the girls they couldn't sing, they might not show up at all, and whatever it would be. So this is a getter almost of a Hiraz Shah, of an emergency to be Makarev people, which did have a halachic basis, but it wasn't necessarily something to be translatable as a general, as a general rule. Now, I admit, the Sri Dei Hetra would, would apply 100% to NCSY. NCSY is dealing with almost the same situation as the Sri Dei But I'll give you an example of how it was abused. Um, there was a modern Orthodox uh, school that I was, I was very involved in, and... Uh, the principal was a progressive principal. I'm, I'm not presently involved uh, with the school anymore. Uh, and uh, he wanted to put on a, uh, he wanted this high school to put on a, a Les Miserables, uh, the play, a Broadway play, which involves a lot of musical singing and the like. And uh, he wanted to say that we can allow the girls to sing uh, as long as uh, some boy is humming along as well, based on Trey Koli Lomishtami. Now, Les Miserables was not a Kirov event. It was not necessarily calculated to bring people to a heightened awareness of Torah and mitzvahs. So to use the Sri Dei H for those types of recreational events is really not, uh, not proper. But as I say, it certainly can be used for benching. It can be used for Zemiros uh, and certainly for Bali Chuva or people who are not yet from. Uh, it can be used as a way of allowing them to participate in a in a, a way that makes them feel 
closer to Hashem. There are also other shilas with Kalisha. Does it apply to recorded music? Is there a difference between audio and video? Right? These are all chilukim, and there are positions that are mekel on all of these things, and there are positions that are machmer on all of these things. Now, the final point is, it is reported me pi shmua. And here you're going to have to figure out how, how this works. This is, uh, I don't know if there's any definitive evidence of this, that Rav Shimshon Afal Hirsch, who was the Rav in Frankfurt, used to attend opera. Now, it's extremely, now again, I, I can't say I know that this is true, but this is what is reported. Now, this is extremely difficult to understand what the heter is. Number one, opera is live music, not recorded. Okay, you're sitting in an opera. Number two, uh, women were soloists, not just uh, as part of a chorus. So what type of heter do you have for a solo woman singing in a live performance without a chorus? There seems to be zero heter for that. The only possible heter, and I would be very surprised is, because it's connected to Shulchan Aruch, is that Rav Hirsch came to the maskana that the Isra of Kol Isha is only for brachos, kriyashma, tefillah, and uh, Torah, and there is no Isra of Kol Isha when you're not doing one of those things. Now, are there Rishonim that say that? Yes, there are. There are Rishonim that say that. There are Rishonim that say that the whole sugya of Kol Isha only applies to brachos, tefillah, and Talmud Torah. There are such shitas. But the Shulchan Aruch in Evan Oezer and the Ramah reject that shita. So to me, it would be extremely schwer, extremely difficult uh, to simply say, I go like the Rishonim that uh, are cholek on the Shulchan Aruch and the Ramah. But that's the only possible heter I could, I could imagine. Because uh, going to an opera is the paradigm of Kolisha. You know, there are heterim for recorded music, and there are heterim for mixed choirs, and there may even be heterim for uh, two women singing. But a soloist in a live performance, Bichlal has no has no heter at all. So, uh, again, I, I don't want to say Rav Hirsch did it, but, but I, I've seen it reported. By the way, another thing Rav Hirsch did, which indeed is reported, and this is fascinating, uh, is that, you know, he established in Frankfurt, he established an educational system from elementary school all the way to yeshiva, gedola. Right? He established it. People know of Rav Hirsch today as a great writer, but he was a tremendous community builder. He was a tremendously gifted organizer and, and a builder of, of community and the like. But it is said that in secular studies, they divided the day between Limude Kodesh and Limude Cho, that the boys didn't wear kippos, they didn't wear yarmulkes in the yeshiva during the hours of secular study. The Rav Hirsch held that there was not a chiv to wear a yarmulke all the time. Now, this is absolutely unthinkable today, but in, but in Germany that was the Hanhaga, that even very from people did not, not wear a kippah when they were not learning or making a bracha or the like. That, I think, is, that, I think, is uh, documented that way. Uh, yeah. Question, oh, yeah. Going against the Kaza says it's because they're going not to, not to wear a kippah. Yeah, all I'm saying is that Germany had its own minhagen, uh, meaning to say, uh, remember that... Uh, the Kehila of Yidin in Ashkenaz, although Rav Hirsch was a newcomer, so to speak, because he, he, he created his Kehila in the 1850s. But when he created the Kehila of Frankfurt, he was going back to many old German minhagim. And, you know, the Taz was Polish, and the German minhagim had different, different Jerachim. So uh, many of these things were taloi on, on, on minhagim. Yeah. Yeah, you Is it consistent with the Jewish Ashkafa to support the death penalty in secular courts? Okay, so that's a, <laughs> that's a different question. <coughs> is it um, consistent with Jewish hashkafa to support the death penalty in secular courts? So, in other words, uh, should I uh, be in favor of uh, the state of New York or the state of California imposing death penalties on murderers or the like? So, here is the interesting thing. On one hand, we know that the Torah itself does create death penalties for many, many offenses. But at the same time, we also know that the rules of evidence were so amazingly difficult that the Sanhedrin almost never killed anybody. Right? The Mishnah Mako says, if the Sanhedrin killed somebody once every seven years, and according to one opinion, once every 70 years, they were called a bloody court. The guy always got off. I mean, Hashem, I mean, you never get off with Hashem, but in terms of the court, they got off. 
And Rabbi Akiva even said, and if I would have been on the Sanhedrin, nobody would ever get killed. I'd always find a way out. So the Pashtas, if you look at just the halachic system, the halachic system has the death penalty as kind of a warning of how bad the sin is, but it's not really meant to be applied. So you would think, therefore, I should not be an advocate for capital punishment in the secular system. But the counter-argument is that the secular system of Goyim, let's put aside Eretz Yisrael for a moment, is not based on the 613 mitzvahs of the Torah. It is based on the Sheva mitzvahs b'nei noyach. And under the Sheva mitzvahs b'nei noyach, you don't need all of the procedural requirements of a Jewish Sanhedrin. You don't need warning. You don't need to warn the guy. You don't need two witnesses. Circumstantial evidence is enough. And since <coughs> murder is certainly one of the Noahide commandments, and the punishment for violating the Noahide commandment is, in fact, the death penalty, so I ought to be in favor of the death penalty because I am supporting the state following the Noahide laws which it has an obligation to do, following the seven commandments of Noah. So as a result, there are a number of poskim that have said that we should be in favor of capital uh, punishment in a secular system because generally speaking, the capital punishment is only going to be imposed for crimes that are punishable by capital punishment under the Noahide law. I mean, it's unthinkable. I mean, I mean, uh, I mean first of all, even theft is punishable by capital punishment even though we're not going that far. So what was interesting is, uh, Ravarin Soloveitchik, <coughs> Zechron Olivracha, he was the uh, younger brother of Rav Yosef Dov Soloveitchik. Ravarin Soloveitchik was a great, you know, he was Rav Chaim Brisker's uh, grandson. Uh, and he was a great, great, great Talmud Chacham, also a very, very sweet, uh, sweet man. I remember when I lived in Chicago, uh, we used to see Ravarin go shopping with his Rebbitson all the time. Like he would just he would let us go into the store and you know go shopping and uh, he'd have a cart. Just a very very brilliant person, a great great Talmud Chacham, a great Gadol, but a very simple person in that way, very unpretentious person. Um, but Ravarin Soloveitchik actually testified when the state of Illinois was debating whether they should have capital punishment. Ravarin Soloveitchik testified against it. He said he was not in favor of capital punishment and Jewish law would not support it. So a lot of Rabbanim questioned Ravarin Soloveitchik. They said, what are you talking about? Under the Noahide laws, uh, a, a Noahide court, meaning a non-Jewish court, is supposed to execute people who murder and the like. And you don't need to aid him and you don't need warning. So the, the procedures of a secular court to administer capital punishment is perfectly consistent with the Noahide Code. So how could you say that you were against a secular court <coughs> following the seven commandments of Noah? That's good kasha. So Ravarin gave two answers to this. First of all, he said, the rule that a Noahide court is supposed to impose capital punishment for violations of the Noahide Code presupposes a fair and impartial justice system. So here he's being a little political. And he said, given the state of juries and, and courts in the United States, which again, this is, uh, there's a lot of evidence that uh, capital punishment is disproportionately imposed on uh, minorities and there's racial discrimination and the like. <coughs> Ravarin felt, you could argue with this, but Ravarin felt that courts and juries <coughs> were not uh, fair, they were not objective, uh, they were biased, they were accepting evidence. Now you don't need to aid them, but you still need reliable evidence. And the evidence they were accepting <coughs> was not really reliable evidence. So he felt that tainted the procedure, and B'chiyai Gavna, even a secular court should not impose capital punishment. That was reason number one. Reason number two is a Chiddush of Ravarin himself, and I've actually mentioned this Chiddush before. Ravarin says, and there's a mucker for this and some other earlier achreinim, that when the Gemara tells us violations of the Noahide Code can be punishable by capital punishment, it isn't saying they must impose capital punishment. Rather, the Torah is giving them the latitude to impose whatever punishment they want, even capital punishment. But, Ravaran said, 
A civilized society is normally not going to do that except for the most extreme cases. And if a court or a society decides that the punishment should be imprisonment or something else, they are not violating the Noahide Code because the Noahide Code never compelled. This is a Chiddush. You would not get this impression from the Gemara. But he learns when, it, when the Gemara says, Asarasan Zui Misasan that the Noahide prohibition carries capital punishment, that is a maximum punishment. That is not a required punishment. And therefore, we're entitled to basically say a civilized society should err on the side of life. So those were his two reasons. But as I say, many, many Rabbanim do go with the uh, position of your question that the Noahide law says capital punishment, so non-Jewish court should impose it. Now, in Eretz Yisrael, it's a very different situation. In Eretz Yisrael, uh, a Jewish state... So a Jewish state, the Pashtus, needs to be governed by Torah law. And what that would mean is, under Torah law, for a Jewish based in to impose capital punishment, you need Adim, you need witnesses, you need warning, at least vis-a-vis -vis a Jewish defendant. So as a result, it would be very, very questionable if the state of Israel would be allowed uh, to impose capital punishment on a Jewish person unless all of the requirements of halacha were met. And even then, you don't have a Sanhedrin that has smicha. So they're not able to do it. So you'd have to differentiate between a Jewish state and a, a non-Jewish state. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Rav mentioned before about uh, <coughs> like only the Avot can kind of have like a subjective... <coughs> yeah. Yeah, this is a, a difficult question. It's a bit of a painful question, and that is, uh, <clears throat> I mean, he's one example, but the, the, the question basically was that there were great Hasidic rabbis, there still are some great Hasidic rabbis that seem to break the rules. Uh, they dive in uh, Shachris, Mincha time, and, and uh, Mincha, Marif time, and, and the end Shabbos uh, three days later. <laughs> and the question becomes, like, what's going on? And all, all, all I can say is, that I have less of a problem with the Rebbe than with the followers. I, I can believe that there may be unusual Sadiqim that kind of, I mean, some will say this is Apikaris, and maybe if Chaim Velazhner wouldn't agree, but there may be an idea that they have a private relationship with God. I mean, the Torah is like for everybody, and they have, a, you know, they have their unique relationship, and you know, who knows what's going on. But uh, I don't see any possible justification for the Stam followers to kind of imitate the Rebbe. I mean, there are certain, some things... I mean, Lubavitch Rebbe used to say this generally. I mean, he would say, some things are for a Rebbe to do and they're not meant to be imitated by other people. These are private hanhagos. And uh, the problem is when you have, like, regular people doing these extraordinary things about breaking away from the limits of halacha, then almost by definition, they're doing something wrong. The Rebbe himself, you know, you know who knows? People can have their private, uh, private arrangements. Yeah. Okay, so assuming that mm -hmm. all restrictions of Yichud and Shomer Gira between staff members are being followed, is a single person who's somebody's not married allowed to work on a cure trip with mixed gender interaction and activities? Yeah, so that's a very, very difficult question. Assuming that the halachos of Yichud and the Gia, you know, sexual touching, are being observed, is a single person allowed to work for cure of purposes with a mixed group of uh, boys and girls or teenagers, college students, whatever the age is, uh, is it allowed or is it not allowed? So here I would suggest that I, I would not phrase the question in terms of allowed or not allowed because it's not a one-size-fit-all answer. And that is assuming, and this is very important, assuming you're keeping the halachas, that's step number one, Got to keep Yichud, got to keep Nagiyah. Uh, if you're not doing that, then you can't do it. That's for sure. But assuming you're keeping the halachas, the question then becomes, what is the effect on you? And that's a very subjective thing. Uh, if you find yourself getting aroused, if you find yourself, excuse my, my language for being explicit, uh, fantasizing and thinking about uh, the women and imagining different things, then it's something that is dragging you down. It's something that is affecting your kedusha. Uh, you need to get out of it. And by the way, that could even happen for a married person as well. Uh, I mean, if it's affecting you in that way, it's not for you. If, on the other hand, you can honestly say that I'm kind of objective, I'm doing my job, and uh, I'm not uh, distracted, 
then I'm not going to say it's us. I mean, I mean, think about this. I mean, you have men teachers in seminaries. Now, granted, in some ways, a seminary may not be as bad as what you're describing because a seminary, at least the girls are dressed sinaeus. In the group you're talking about, you're confronting those problems. But still, uh, a man teaches in seminary. It could, be, it could be a very, very similar problem in some ways. Uh, so a lot of these halachos depend very much on how it is affecting you, meaning to say there is both an objective component, now red lines that you cannot cross, like Yichud and Nagiya, those are objective. They, they apply to everybody. And then there are subjective components of how does something affect you as a person, and that depends on your libido, and that depends on your imagination, that depends on all sorts of many, many different things, and it may not be the proper thing. And by the way, this can come up in a lot of contexts that are seemingly innocuous, but they could be more dangerous than you might think. Uh, let's, just, let's imagine, for example, you have a 25-year-old rabbi, you know, just got married a year ago. He would like to invite his 17-year-old seminary students uh, to his house for Shabbos. What's wrong? Hmm, you know, not so posh it. Not so posh it. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, I, I can't prove things by anecdotes, but you know, there are st stories out there of marriages getting broken up uh, because of this type of behavior. And in fact, without, I don't want to talk about uh, the incident that everybody's talking about. I, I've talked a lot about it already. Uh, but that's how all of these things start. You know, the, the rabbis that cross boundaries and are get involved in sexual abuse, I mean, they didn't like enter the rabbinate so they could become predators. They don't say, ah, I got my smicha. Now I can go and uh, you know, molest uh, children and women. No, that's not how it works. This was all L'Shem Shemayim originally. But you know, you cross the boundaries a little bit. And you say, OK, maybe there's yichud, but I'm doing it to help somebody. Uh, the woman is so distraught, why can't I hold her hand and give her a little comfort? Meaning, they're doing it for good reasons. But you cross the boundaries you get yourself in a position of a point of no return. And then it turns into what it turns into. Right? The, the Torah is a very wise system. I mean, you know, you know, Hashem doesn't, doesn't, doesn't need me to say that. And when the Torah has all of these rules and all of these boundaries, it's not because yichud with a woman is such a bad thing. Yichud with a woman is not a bad thing. Nothing is going to... Right? But once the boundaries are dissolved, it will lead to bad things at the end. And therefore, it's better to kind of avoid the, the situations. So my answer to you is it very much depends on how it affects a person. And different people are affected in different ways. Yeah? Um, the uh, okay. iconic way that uh, Muslims pray with going all, their head all the way to the ground. I've yeah. heard two stories. I don't know which is true. And both of them say that this came from Judaism originally saying that Muhammad saw this during Yom Kippur, and that's why they do it five times a day instead of three. And I've also heard someone else tell me that he was, he's like a Yemenite from some community, and he was, it's not like the general Yemenite, but different where they said, oh no, Jews used to pray like this all the time, like when you go Baruch Hashem, you'd go all the way down instead of just, and he was telling me, I don't know if this is true, but he was trying to tell me that the, the Rambam's son, was complaining about chairs being brought into a synagogue or something, and how the synagogue used to not have chairs. Is this true, or is this what is the truth about this? And what? Yeah, what is yeah. The true? issue is uh, the way the uh, Muslims uh, bow when they pray. Right, they get on their knees and they have a full, uh, sometimes a full uh, body uh, prostration and, and the like. Uh, first of all, Muhammad's relationship with the Jewish people is actually very, very interesting. Muhammad actually wanted to convert. Uh, he was kind of an illiterate uh, camel driver, and uh, he worked for Jewish people, and he liked uh, what he saw in Judaism, and he wanted to convert, uh, but you know he, he wasn't considered to be uh, ready or worthy of converting, whatever the reason was. So he started his own thing. Uh, but you know, Muhammad uh, had an imagination. He loved midrashim. He loved stories. So he made up his own stories afterwards. But uh, <clears throat> and the like. So there's going to be a lot of uh, commonality between Judaism and Islam because uh, Muhammad had a lot of exposure to Jews uh, in his early uh, years, in his 20s. 
and the like. Now, the notion of body prostration was absolutely a feature of Jewish worship. In the Beis HaMikdash, every time, not just on Yom Kippur, people think it's only Yom Kippur, not true. Every time the Shem Hashem was mentioned in the Beis HaMikdash, which was always Shem Havaya, people did a full body prostration and the like. Now, there is a problem, the Torah does say, that we're not allowed to do a, a full body prostration on a stone floor because it resembles idolatry. That's why you need a, a Yom Kippur, you need a rug, or you need a talus, or you need something. Uh, but uh, Tachanan, the original form of Tachanan, Tachanan wasn't just, you know, this. Tachanan was, I bow with my head to the ground. That is, that is what Tachanan was originally. So it got into misuse in some ways because on one hand, since other religions adopted it, we don't want to do things that other religions are doing, even though they got it from us. But I remember reading, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to look this up because it's, 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 it's a vague memory in my head, and I wish I could find the documentation, that Rabbi Avigdor Miller actually said, he talked about a few private things a person should do. I remember, and again, I, I, I wish I could find it, that he said that once a day, in the privacy of your home, you should do a full body prostration to Hashem with the appropriate hefsik between you and the stone floor, like you know, a garment or a robe, to give yourself a sense of reverence for our Kaddish Borcha. Then he says, we don't do it publicly anymore, we don't do it in show, you know, we don't do it, but this in fact was an authentic way of worship to our Kaddish Baruch So it certainly had, uh, had its place. Another example is that uh, the, uh, the authentic Jewish way of prayer was to raise your hands to Shemayim. Raise your hands up. Today, uh, we tend not to do that too much. Some people do a little, little hand raise, but you know, the notion of literally doing that. So there were modalities of worship that were characteristic of Jewish worship that kind of got stolen from us, and uh, we don't want to look like we're imitating them. It's still that idea that we don't want to look like the Muslims. Yeah. That wouldn't, but, um, there, well, by contrast, shouldn't Ashkenazim want to do it as not look like Christians? That's different yeah. Europe. Well, uh, okay, I understand. Like, e either way, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to be imitating somebody. <laughs> but I think it was thought that um, since the bowing, it's not just a question of I don't want to, in other words, since bowing was associated with those other religions, so there's a Maris Ayan that it looks like you're practicing that other, uh, that other uh, religion. Now, the five times a day also, right, the fact that uh, Muslims pray five times a day is, you know, our Yom Kippur prayer is five times a day. And by the way, that's why the Mepharshim say that the Golas of Yishmael, the ascendancy of the Arabs before Mashiach comes, is the most dangerous Golas for Am Yisrael. Because unlike the other enemies that only have physical might, B'nai Yishmael have spiritual power. And spiritual power can only be defeated by spiritual means. Their spiritual power is circumcision. Their spiritual power is modesty, sexual modesty, tzinias. Their spiritual power is prayer. That they pray every day the number of times we only pray on Yom Kippur. And that's why they are such a dangerous enemy. Because they bring to the table a spiritual power. In fact, it was an amazing thing. Um, I remember reading a few years ago when Jordan uh, was going to, allowing Israelis to visit Jordan, uh, there was some talk that they wanted to uh, not let teenagers come in because Israeli teenagers were not dressing in accordance with the proper standards of modesty that the kingdom, the kingdom of Jordan wanted to preserve. What a chilol Hashem. I mean, the chilol Hashem is that the Goyim say, we don't want to let Jews in because they're not, they're not sinious enough. <laughs> but that, that was the case. And those are sechuyas, in spite of the fact that so many of the Arab nations or, or Arabs are, you know, are murderers and everything else and they do all sorts of bad things. They have certain spiritual strengths that give them mezuchus. By the way, the Meshech Chochmah says a fascinating thing. The Meshech Chochmah says that we know Chazal teach us that Yishmael did tshuva towards the end of his life. Yishmael did tshuva. So the Meshech Chochmah says 
that that also means the B'nai Yishmael, the followers of Islam that are descended from Yishmael, are also going to do tshuva, B'yachar Esayamim. And the first stage in the tshuva of B'nai Yishmael was conversion to Islam. In other words, the monotheism of Islam replaced the paganism of the Arab world. And that was a step towards tshuva. And some want to say the second stage in Islamic tshuva is what is called the Abrahamic Accords. That's where you have Dubai and United Arab Emirates opening up uh, relations with Israel and even having shows. I think there are two Chabad houses in Dubai, I think. It's like the old joke about uh, the desert islands, right? <laughs> and there are two shows on the desert islands, and the, Jew, the one Jew says, that's the show I used to dub in. And how, many, how many Jews are in Dubai that you need two, two Chabad houses? <laughs> but, uh, but, but there are. And that's also a stage in Shuva in which the B'nai Yishmael is coming closer to the Jewish people. Yeah, the issue, the question was that we have so many statements in the Agada of the Gemara and in Midrashim that seem to be very, very difficult to believe. Uh, how do we know when to take something literally and when is something symbolic? So actually, uh, next week, when we go back to our Torah Shavuot Peh, that's the next thing the Rambam is going to talk about in the introduction. Uh, the Rambam writes the following. I'll, I'll give you a little preview of it. The Rambam writes that... There are three schools of thought about Agadita. Uh, one says Agadita is literal, and as a result, it's Baba Mises, meaning they, they disparage Agadita. They say, oh, Chazal are saying making literal statements. The literal statements are ridiculous. So Chazal were either foolish or liars. That's position number one. Position number two is the other way. Agadita is literal, and Chazal are right. If Moshe Rabbeinu is said to be 20 amos high and he could only reach Og Melech Abashan's ankle, then that's what it was. Moshe is 40 feet high and Og Melech Abashan is whatever, 300 you know, feet high. Now, the Rambam says, both positions have a common denominator that Agadita is literal, but one group says it's therefore false and the other group says it's therefore true. So the Rambam says the first group are apikorsen and the second group are idiots. The Rambam says it is wrong to pose the question, is Agada true or false? That is a false binary question. Agada is certainly true, but the truth of Agadita is not always meant to be a literal truth. It is meant to express symbolic spiritual ideas with metaphors and analogies. This is a very important yesod. Instead of asking, is it true or not true, you have to say it's always true. But what is the truth? Is the truth the literal? Or is the truth the metaphorical and symbolic? And the Rambam says the Chachamim often want to convey the deepest spiritual ideas through far-fetched parables, mishalim. But then the Rambam says, on the other hand, there is a core of Agadita that is quite literal, kind of telling you the history of something. So how do you know what's literal and what's not? The fact that something's supernatural doesn't mean it's not literal because, you know, miracles can happen. Miracles did happen. So here we have a very disappointing answer I'm going to tell you. The Rambam says, Be'ezra Sashem, I am going to write a book that will go through all of the Agarita in Shas, and I will tell you what is meant to be literal and what is meant to be symbolic and what the symbolic meaning is. What a great book that would be, right? Unfortunately, we have no such book. Either the Rambam didn't get around to writing it, he was so busy with other things, or he wrote it and for some reason it got lost. We don't have it. So the Rambam is telling you that there's a key to it, but we don't have the key. We lost the key. We never had the key. 
So the truth of the matter is that um, there are other Mephorshim, though, who try to unlock the symbolic meaning of Agadita. Uh The greatest and the most famous is Maral, Maral of Prague, uh, basically viewed Agadita in highly symbolic ways. And if you go through any Agadita that the Maral wrote on, and he did write on most of the Agadita in Shas, the strange omission is that there's no, you know, the Maral has what are called Chidushe Agada, Alashas, uh, he doesn't have it on Maseches Brachos, which is strange. Brachos has almost the most, I think, the most Agadita of all of Shas. And for some reason, that's the one the Maral didn't do. Okay. But he did everything else. And you'll see uh, kind of the symbolic language that the Maral uses. So uh, all I can tell you is, you know, you don't really know, but I can say that if you don't believe that an Agada is literal, you are not a Kofar or an Apikoris. Uh, as long as you believe that there's deep truths in here that are expressed in different ways, so you're not malig, you're not making fun of the chachamim, you're not denying the greatness of the chachamim, but you're simply saying their words have to be understood in a symbolic way, that is an absolutely legitimate approach to Agadita and Medrash. Uh, yeah? Is it uh, permissible to have coffee or, or sort of tea during Sukkot Zimra? Uh, and is there any kind of particular cut-up uh, during? Yeah, so the question is, are you allowed to drink uh, coffee, tea, or anything uh, during, uh, during Sukkot Zimra? So first of all, it's obvious that I'm assuming by your question that you already made the shahakol because you wouldn't be allowed to say a bracha during Sukkot Zimra because that would be an interruption like talking, right? So that's a given. If you didn't have a bracha that's covering you, you would not be allowed to do so. Now, assuming that you made a bracha, let's say, before Korbanos, and you were drinking throughout Korbanos, and you want to continue drinking uh, during Pesuket de Zimra, Me'ikar uh, Adin, it is mutter, because uh, it is only prohibited to have a hefsek in speech, and drinking is not per se a hefsek. Nevertheless, it is brought down that it's generally improper. It's not considered uh, that respectful to Hashem to take drinks in the middle. I mean, imagine you're with the president, you know, and you just... Now, if he gave you a cup of coffee, that's one thing, but you, know, you wouldn't just bring your own coffee and start uh, <laughs> drinking at a meeting with the president. So it's not considered cover dick. So, so I would say it would depend. If your throat, for example, is very sore or you uh, have difficulty talking, you need to clear your throat, so then I would say uh, that's okay. That's almost a tzorich tefila. But generally, one should try to, to avoid it. Yeah. Um, so uh, the Gemara and Sukkah... Uh, Lamed uh, Amad Aleph. It says, uh, it brings the story of, uh, uh, I believe, Rabbi Yehuda instructing these sellers of Hadassim to have the have the owners of the land cut it, the non-Jews, cut cut the thing, because if they cut it themselves, they would be stealing. Yeah. And it, it, sa- uh, it says that because Stam, Stam land is stolen. Uh, Stam land owned by non-Jews is stolen. Yeah. So how do we today, uh, or how, how is there the um, the sheet of allowing uh, Yuval Nachri? Where why do why is farmland? <laughs> even if they say I like my I've owned it for twenty generations, it's still like the farmland yeah, yeah, is yeah, yeah, yeah. still. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the question was that the Gemara in Sukkah uh, makes an assumption that um, much land, most land, or at least some land in the hands of non-Jews is assumed to be stolen land. Uh, and that's why you shouldn't cut your hadasim uh, for sukkahs from the non-Jewish land because then you would be, you know, you'd be stealing because the land belongs to somebody else. So uh, if that's the case, then how by Shemitah can I rely on what is called the produce right, of non-Jewish land? Right? One of the ways we get around Shemitah restrictions is we buy the produce uh, from non-Jewish land. By the way, uh, just a, a point of just clarification. Do not confuse, and maybe we should talk about the laws of Shemitah at some other point, uh, Yavul Nachri and Heter Mechira. They are very, very close, but they're also very, very different. Yavul Nachri means I buy the produce from land that is owned by a guy. The guy owns the land all the time. Now, Yavul Nachri is also a machlokas. But the minag of Yerushalayim has been, Yavul Nachri does not have any Shemitah restrictions. And this is nothing to do with Dati Liyumi. Uh, even the Eid Haredes, the Badat, <coughs> takes the position, Yavul Nachri 
does not have the laws of Shemitah attached. This is based on Rav Yosef Karo, and this is said to be the Minad Rishulayim. The Chazinish happens to be Machmer, and what's happening is that through Rav Chaim Kenevsky, B'nai Brak Minhagim are permeating Yerushalayim, but the Minad Yerushalayim has been Yavul Nachri as Mutter. Now, Hetra Mechira is based on Yavul Nachri by the Rabbanut selling all the land to a guy, but because it's an institutional pro forma sale, most of the Haredi world does not accept it. But not accepting Hetra Mechira as a legitimate abrogation of Shemitah has nothing to do with Yavul Nachri. Yavul Nachri is accepted. Okay, that's important to separate them. Meaning, Heter Mechira depends on Yavul Nachri, but Yavul Nachri does not depend on Heter Mechira. Two different concepts. But your question is, how can I... I'm sorry. Can I just add one point to yep. the question? Also, you're not allowed to sell land to non-Jews, so there's yep, even that's correct. less of a way to... That, that, that's, that's correct. There is an issue of the Arisa to sell land in Eretz Yisrael to a non-Jew. Although some matter, in fact, that was the Chazanish's argument against the Heter Mechira. And Rav Kook responded that that only applied to idolaters and pagans. It did not apply to Muslims who were monotheists. I guess that's part of the argument there. Okay. But be it as it may, uh, putting aside the Avera, because even if it's an Avera, once it's done, it's done. I mean, that's a separate thing. Uh, I think the difference would be that once you have a system of courts and a system of laws, then you no longer assume that uh, land is stolen. Meaning the assumption of the Gemara that a guy is typically in possession of stolen land kind of referred to a scenario where there was a certain lawlessness in the community and in which uh, Jews were not protected. So if some guy knocked a Jew off his land and just took it over, like Nazi Germany or something, so nobody would complain and nobody would enforce and nobody would protect. So we have to assume that it was stolen, primarily from other Jews. That's the context there. Mashen came today, particularly in a Jewish state, uh, mm -hmm. although you know, Jews sometimes suffer that as well, even here, but uh, you no longer have the same assumption, meaning the assumption changes based on a legal system that protects people that file complaints. So that would be the difference there. Uh, yeah? Uh, how does one train himself uh, to imagine that Mashiach could come any moment. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I, I think I mentioned a few days ago, Rav Chaska Levenstein, the great uh, Mashkiach of Panovich, used to say that a good Bal Musr has to have a good imagination. You have to kind of imagine Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, imagine Matan Torah, imagine Kriyas Yamsef. You know, different people have different capacities for this. When you imagine, you know, think about if you ever heard of method acting, uh, like Marlon Brando, different Hollywood actors, they specialize in really imagining what it's like to be in a situation. And then they can genuinely cry or laugh or whatever it would be. That's a, but that takes a certain power. That takes a certain powerful imagination. Uh, a lot of us don't have that powerful imagination a little bit. So it's not an easy thing to emotionally, and even, if you, even if you believe in Mashiach, I believe in Mashiach 100%, but to emotionally you know, f feel for it. So, Part of it is, like anything else, uh, practice makes perfect, meaning uh, you start doing it, you start imagining, you start thinking, you start dramatizing. And uh, what happens with the human being generally is, as you habitu habituate yourself <coughs> in certain behaviors, it becomes more part of you and the like. But you need to, and, well, let me add another aspect to this. You need to fill in the picture a little bit. By that I mean that you need to study what life under Mashiach will be like. Because right now, if you just have this general idea, oh, Mashiach will come and we'll have the Beis HaMikdash. Well, what did the Beis HaMikdash look like? What were Kurbanos like? What was the Sholosh Regalim when you had millions of Jews coming? In other words, part of what helps you to imagine something is filling in the details of the picture. So it's not just a vague thing, but it really is something that you know, you can picture in your mind. So learning will help you with that too. You learn about Mashiach, you learn about the Beis HaMikdash, you learn about how the Korban Pesach was brought, and then it becomes more real to you, and then you can uh, imagine it in a stronger way. Yeah. Does the Rav um, believe that there's 36 um, hints that we can that are keeping up the world? And yeah. so, why would it be 36 and why would it be hidden? Yeah, uh, so well, the question is, do I believe are there 36 hidden Sadiqim in the world? 
uh, and why, what, what is significant about the number 36. First of all, let, let me point out that the source of the 36 righteous people is actually a Gemara. But the Gemara does not say they're hidden. The Gemara says at any time there are 36 righteous people who keep the world alive. So the notion that they're hidden is actually not in the Gemara. Not in the Gemara at all. But it is in the Zohar. The Zohar does talk about them as being the hidden tzaddikim. Someone once said that they believe that the Vilna Gaon was one of the 36 hidden tzaddikim. So someone said to him, you know, that's pretty crazy. The Vilna Gaon is certainly a great tzaddik, but we would not call him hidden. I mean, uh, he was known all, all over the whole Jewish world for his greatness. He says, ah, that's your whole point. He's so great that whatever you know about him is a tiny tip of the iceberg. And therefore, yeah, the Vilna Gaon is a hidden tzaddik too, because there's so much more than even what you think you're able to see. Uh, and then in Hasidic stories, there are so many stories about the hidden tzaddikim that, uh, you know, they're like janitors in nightclubs. Again, some of them are very, very like, funny <laughs> stories. Like people who are playing cards or people in bars. You know, but these are the hidden, you know, these are the real hidden tzaddikim. A lot of stories of Baal Tov with kind of very unusual characters who wind up to be the tzaddikim of, of the world. Uh, but why, uh, why the number 36? So the Gemara in Chulin has a drusha, it's really a gematria, yasel machak eloi, that God keeps the world alive for those who are waiting for him, and the gematria of lo, lamid vav, is 36. So the Gemara derives it from a gematria. Uh, what would the svara be? I, I, I really don't know. I mean, the one thing about 36 is it's double chai, and that would mean that they bring the generation to God's blessings in life in this world and brings them to the Olam Haba. So it could be that's the number of, of 36. But other than that, I, I don't have a particular Hezber about the number 36. Yeah? Can the Rabbi explain if there's different ways to fulfill the mitzvah of Shnai Mikra, especially for people who want to start the mitzvah and they don't necessarily understand the value of yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the mitzvah of Shnayim Mikra Vyecha Targum, that you have to read uh, the, the Pasuk twice and the Aramaic translation once, is a, is a, is a chiv, Bapashtis, uh, from the Gemara itself. And it mentions anyone that keeps the mitzvah of Shnayim Mikra Vyecha Targum is Zoha to Arichus Yomim, is given a blessing of long life. In fact, some people have pointed out that this is the only chilek of Torah learning that is explicitly mandated by halacha. It's almost as if to say, if you can only do one thing in your learning, some would actually say, Shnayim Mikvecha Targum is the one thing that you have to do. Now, the problem is, of course, besides the fact that it can take a lot of time, that, that is something that can, can take time, although the more you do it, uh, you'll, 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 you'll do it uh, more quickly with time, is that the role of Targum doesn't make a lot of sense for many of us. Uh, targum in the time of Chazal made perfect sense because the spoken language of even the Jews in Eretz Yisrael was Aramaic. Hebrew was like a more advanced language. So many people read the Chumash. They didn't know what the Hebrew meant. They look at the Targum. Baruch Hashem. Now I know what the, what the Pasuk means. With us, it's exactly the opposite. We look at the Targum, it's incomprehensible. In fact, it's almost the opposite. If I, if I want to know what the Targum means, I'll look in the Pasuk and say, oh, I, you know, it's like, so, so what does Targum do for me if, if you know, I, I don't get anything more from the Targum than I get from the Pasuk because the Pasuk tells me what the Targum, what the targum means. So because of this, there are poskim that say that uh, Targum is Lavdafka, the Aramaic, but Targum is the translation of whatever language you understand. So as a result, many shito say you can fulfill Shnaya Mikra Vyecha Targum by reading an art scroll or reading a translation that is faithful to Chazal. I don't mean translations that reject Torah Shabbat and the like. That makes a lot of sense. And I tell people this, Halacha that they can be so mech on the translation of, of art scroll or the like. However, however, there are opinions that differ and they say that even if you don't understand the Targum, but the Targum is also divinely inspired, Ruach HaKodesh, there's a certain Kedusha to it, so you can't just switch it uh, with another language. But I think for all intents and purposes, we can. Now the question that one might raise is this, though. 
whether my targum is the Aramaic or whether my targum is the art scroll, if I already know what the Pasuk means, why do I have to read the targum? In other words, why can't I just do Shnaya Mikra? Why do I have to do the Yechotar? I mean, if I read a Pasuk and I know what the, I know what the Pasuk says, then what is the Chiyav of reading the Targum? I would understand if we would say, any Pasuk you don't understand, you got to look at a translation because we want you to understand. But that's not the way the Halacha works. The Halacha works, you got to do it for every Pasuk, right? So that I, I, don't, I actually don't, don't fully understand either. But, but apparently uh, the idea was that even if you know what the Pasuk says, there may be nuances that are escaping you that the translation will focus your mind on noticing certain things that you might otherwise not notice. The tachlis of the mitzvah is very clear, that a Jew should be familiar with the Torah. Right? The Torah is the foundation of everything. Uh, the Torah Shebechsav is the foundation of Torah Shebaalpeh. Every Jew should know the Chamisha Chumshe Torah. Okay, and th therefore it's a very important mitzvah in that way. Uh, yeah? So it's like in Yiddish Torah, right, we put a big emphasis on wine. Like wine, yeah. Things, like what's the deepness of wine and why do you use it for all of it? Yeah, wine. So wine is very important in uh, Yiddishkeit. Uh, Kiddush, Havdalah, Bris Mila, Chasana, Pidjan Aben, right? All of the happy occasions in the Beis HaMikdash, when the Levim sang songs of praise to Hashem, uh, it was on the wine that was poured on the Mizbeach. Uh, David HaMelech talks, well, well, number one, one aspect of wine is that wine is something that brings a person to a joyous state. You know, eating apples doesn't, doesn't do it, right? Mm -hmm. But wine creates a certain inner joy, and therefore it fits Avodah Hashem. That should always be done with joy, and therefore wine is connected to that. Uh, the other idea is that a wine, the Jewish people are compared to a vine, a vine, because just like a grape, by squeezing the grape, you get the best from it, you get its juice. So too, the Jewish people, by the suffering we go through, we become better, we become stronger. And therefore, I look at the grape and I see that even though we suffer so much in Gullus, it'll make us stronger and closer to Hashem. So wine is a very, very significant thing. Uh, yeah? Um, uh, what should be one outlook um, on Jewish or even Christian um, archaeologists who try to archaeologically prove um, stories and events uh, in the Torah, especially if sometimes they go against themselves? And yeah, so the question is, what should our attitude be towards Jewish or Christian archaeologists who try to, well, either prove or disprove uh, biblical events and uh, very often uh, they will interpret the Bible itself, the Tanakh itself, not in accordance with our Masorah or our Torah Shabal Peh. So again, uh, I know that it's, it's always uh, almost uh, dishonest to be a little bit of a cherry picker. <laughs> but I think, you know, when their results confirm what we believe, I think we should use them and point, the, point it out. Uh, when they don't, I think we may have to answer why, but, but we should understand that the Torah does not rise or fall, not just a Tanakh, does not rise or fall in archaeology. There are a lot of events that don't necessarily leave a trace in the world, particularly in desert climates or, or, or whatever it would be. So people say, for example, some people have argued there's almost no archaeological evidence of a whole nation being slaved in Egypt. Now, some Christian archaeologists have claimed to have found something, but a lot of archaeologists say there is no evidence this ever happened. Well, what do they say? Uh, lack of evidence is not evidence of lack, or absence of e Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, meaning not having evidence does not prove that it didn't happen, and therefore, ultimately, we still have to rest in Amuna. So, I think you always have to be careful of don't put your eggs in one basket because the tendency of people is this. If I come across an archaeologist that proves Matan Torah, I'm so excited, wonderful archaeology. Well, what if the ex next archaeologist shows you Yitzhia Smith's rhyme never happened? So the point is, if you're too impressed by archaeology, when it works for you, you're going to be very, very depressed when it doesn't work for you. 
So I think you have to understand that Maya Muna does not depend on any of these things. Yeah? When we talk about Gomel, uh, or Gmilus Chasadim, yeah. um, the word Gomel seems to indicate reward or something deserved. Um, we talked about this in a shir earlier this week. And so why is it then referred to as Gmilus Chasadim, which is, which is good deeds, which are essentially supposed to be baseless from the heart, but then why is it talking about like being deserved or something? Yeah, that's, a very, that's actually a very interesting question, because normally when we say Gomel, Gomel is normally to pay somebody uh, what you owe them because they have earned it in some way. And yet, gemilot chasadim is to give somebody loving kindness, which by definition, they didn't earn, they didn't deserve, but you give it to them anyway. So I would suggest, Mo, though, that maybe that's exactly the point. The point basically is not that they did something to earn it, but Gomel is give them what they're entitled to. A human being is entitled to chesed. Don't look at it like I'm doing you a favor. Look at it as something that you are supposed to do. And therefore it becomes like something you owe the person, even though Lamai said he didn't do anything that, he would owe, uh, that, you know, that you owe him. Right? You see? So that's the whole point. In fact, even tzedakah is the same thing. You know, tzedakah we translate as charity. But staka is also connected to justice. My obligation to take care of the poor is not just charity, I'll take care of you. It's a chiv, I'm a chiv to do it. I owe it to the ani to do it. So I think maybe that's the genius of using the word gomel for that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what are the requisites to be considered a mikubal? To be a mikubal? Yeah. Why, are you in there? You, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> you're applying. <laughs> yeah, what are the requisites to be a mystic, a mystic, a makubal, a student of Kabbalah? So the truth of the matter is, uh, there's no official definition of, of what you have to do, but the standard list is, got to be 40, although the Arizal died at 39, uh, you have to be married, uh, you have to master Shas, the revealed Torah, the Shas and the Shulchan Aruch, uh, you have to be a person with Yeras Shemayim who takes his uh, tefillah, davens very, very seriously with a lot of kavana. Uh, you have to be a person of good midos and character and avas Yisrael. And then you have to have a Rebbe that can in, indoctrinate you into this realm. You can't like just do it by yourself. You need a, we have books of Kabbalah, of course we do. But you need a Rebbe to take you through it step by step by step. Now, I've already said a number of times that um, a little bit of Kabbalah is good for everybody. Uh, that even if I'm not on the Madrega and I didn't learn Shaz and I'm not 40 and I'm not married, a little bit of the light of Kabbalah is something that feeds our neshama and can inspire us and can lift us up. And particularly Kabbalah as reflected through Hasidus. Hasidus kind of took Kabbalah and applied it in a more popular way accessible way. So that's not a violation. When we talk about Mekobo, we're talking about heavy Kabbalah. You're learning Kisvi Yari. That's something that's not for most of us. But a little bit of exposure to Kabbalistic thinking is actually a very good thing. It's not something that you should avoid. And it's brought down that even reading the Zohar, some say even without understanding it, purifies the Neshama. Many Sephardim have that position, that reading the Zohar. The others say, uh, if you don't understand it, it's not so Kedai. But what some say, just the reading of the Zohar. So, uh, I, I, so the most important thing is it can't replace your regular Gemara learning, but it can add a very powerful dimension. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, no, no. What should one consider when, while choosing a, po a posek? Yeah, what, what do you consider when choosing a posek? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a hard question because uh, choosing a posek is a little bit like choosing a wife. You know, it's a, it's a delicate decision. And uh, you need to have compatibility. First of all, you want to choose somebody, I mean, this is the most obvious qualification, who knows halacha, or at least knows, knows the area of halacha that you're going to ask him about. If the guy doesn't know, then you know, that's not going to be your pose. Uh, but second of all, you want to look for someone who is willing to give you time. Because sometimes a person's shaila is a little complicated. It involves knowledge of his past, his history, the different things they're going through, and that has an impact on the answer. 
And if the post tech says, you know, you got two minutes, I have a minute and a half to, to talk to you, that may not, even if the person's the Gadol and that's why going to the Gadol Ador, people think, oh, the best post if I could get the Gadol Ador to be my post Not necessarily. The Gadol Ador is not going to give you that much time. I mean, if you go see Rav Chaim Kanevsky, you will get two minutes max. Now, two minutes may not be long enough. So sometimes you need, let's say, a lower level person in the hierarchy who will give you time. Third of all, you want someone who cares about you. And really, the two are connected, because if they care about you, they'll, they'll give you the time. And someone that is a, a balmidos, because one's ability to understand Torah will be a function of their benadam lechavero and their midos tovos. So, you know, there may be other factors too, but I would, I would think those are the most important ones. Torah knowledge, giving you time, someone who cares about you, someone with midos tovos in a general, in a general way. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, number one, it is, a, is, it is absolutely permitted to have relations with one's wife uh, when she is uh, pregnant. And even though it is 100% true that it is almost impossible that she will get pregnant while she's pregnant, I mean, that, that would never, never happen. I mean, it can happen, but that's an unusual medical condition. It's, it's not going to happen. It is not called wasting seed because Rebbeinu Tom writes that the same principle that says a man can have intercourse with his wife when she's postmenopausal, or had a hysterectomy, or she's just old, is because the use of your seed to facilitate marital intercourse is not wasteful. It is doing the constructive function of generating marital intimacy. Okay, it's very important to understand that although having children is a very important mitzvah, it is not the exclusive reason to get married. There is intrinsically a holiness in the relationship of husband and wife, even if it does not result in children. Okay, we don't consider sexual intimacy between husband and wife as shameful. We consider it to be holy and special. And therefore, it's not levatala, even though there's not going to be a pregnancy there. Yeah. Um, so you were talking um, earlier about Targum Unkelos. And... Uh, so there's a Laman Zamar that says like the Schneimaker of Echad Targum is refers to Targum Unkelos. Yeah. Since the Gemara specifically said, according to that, especially, especially, but since the Gemara specifically said read the Targum Unkelos, does that make that uh, the Targum more authoritative than all other Mephorshim who uh, who are Cholek uh, on Targum Unkelos? So all right, so you are correct that you know. Um, Unkelis is not the final word. I mean, Rashi sometimes is cholek on Unkelis. Chazal, Unkelis was the time of the Tanoim. There are other opinions in Chazal and Midrashim that are cholek on, on, on Unkelis. Uh, so if Chazal say Unkelis is the Targum, does that suggest that Unkelis has primacy of interpretation over any other opposing view? Uh, that's a very good point. But I would say it's very clear that that's not the case. Uh, in fact, sometimes uh, the halakhic conclusions that come from Unkelis, we don't even paskin like. Uh, the reason why Chazal chose Unkelis is simply because Unkelis, unlike other midrashim, explains every word in the Chumash. So consequently, for me to say, learn the midrash, you know, it's not, number one, well, midrash is like 100 times bigger. That's one problem. But number two, the midrash does not comment on every single word in the Pasuk. So if Chazal are looking for something that will take you through every single word, in those days, Unkelis was the best thing to have. But I don't think there was a suggestion that uh, there is a Badafka dominance for Unkelis over, over other opinions. Yeah. Um, I heard someone say, well, is there, if someone has a, like a believe time that's not made out of wool, yeah. is it less, um, are you less Yotze if it's, out of wool, does it matter what material um, that it's made out of? And so people even use like mesh, like what's the... Yeah, yeah, so, so there, there is a halacha that according to many opinions, the only garments that are chayav in Sitzes Minatora are wool garments or linen garments. And for various reasons, we do not wear linen taluses or whatever it is because of a shot, potential shotness problem with wool and linen. 
uh, because sitsis are generally wool. So, uh, you know, so in a linen talus, you'd have a problem with wool and sitsis. Uh, but well, so, so, so consequently, if you eliminate linen as a talus material, then if I wear a nylon or a cotton talus, I'm not committing a sin, but I'm also not fulfilling the mitzvah diorisa of tzitzis. So as a result, uh, many will prefer to wear a woolen garment because then they fulfill a mitzvah diorisa of tzitzis. Is it, is it possible to wear, um, you said that the garment could potentially theoretically be linen. Is it okay to make tzitzis also out of uh, linen? Uh, yes, yes, you, you could do that, uh, but, but there is a problem because it goes back to techelis. Even though the tzitzis could be linen, but the techelis tzitzis have to be wool. That's techelis by definition means blue wool that is dyed that color. So consequently, when you had techelis, uh, you had a problem of, of the wool and the linen tzitzis, so therefore, some authorities say that we should not get into the habit of wearing a linen talus at all with linen sitzes, lest we do so when we have techelis, and there would be a problem. So theoretical, no one ever wore a linen uh, talit. Well, uh, this is a real complicated sugya. There, there are opinions that say that if you wear a linen talit, you will actually put in wool techelis. Other opinions would, would say there's a problem. So... Uh, because of this, the minog has been that we don't wear a linen talus at all because of problems with techelas, problems with shotness, and, and the like. Uh, yeah? Um, why are certain fruits not bound by Hokus Shemitah, and why is there an exception given for um, a fruit like, uh, like such if completely consumed without tasting any of it? Yeah, uh, why are certain fruits not bound by the laws of Shemitah? What, what are you thinking of? Because that you could mean a few different things. Oh, oh, okay, so let, let, let me explain that. This actually ties into what I talked about mamash this afternoon, and that is, uh, in order for a fruit to be bound by the laws of Shemitah, it must have budded during the Shemitah year, which means if it budded before Shemitah, even if most of its growth is during Shemitah and it's harvested during Shemitah, it's not a Shemitah fruit. It's equivalent to a six-year fruit. So a lot of the laws that apply to fruits in the first half of the year is not a special rule about the fruit. It's simply because halachically it is allocated to year number six. Okay? Later on in the year, it will have those halachas because it'll be a fruit that budded after Tishrei. Remember, for, for Shemitah, we don't look at Tu We look at uh, Tishrei as the allocation point for fruit. Okay, now what was your second, second question? Oh, so, so, so these are halachos, uh, because when the, when the Torah says what you do with Shemitah produce, so the Torah emphasizes li'achla, you are permitted to eat it. So Chazal have a drasha that li'achla means you can't waste it, meaning these are halachos. Shemitah fruit is considered kadosh. And because it's kadosh, you cannot treat it with disrespect. And therefore, wasting Shemitah fruit is considered to be a disrespect to that which has the holiness of Shemitah. But as I say, if the fruit is allocated to year six, it doesn't have that holiness. So that law would not apply in that wouldn't, case. Wouldn't then the, uh, at least the seeds, if not also the peel, need to be of some purpose as well? So on that we say no, because uh, the Torah requires uh, consumption for the portions of the fruit that are generally edible. The portions of the fruit that are not edible don't have that kedusha, right? So as a result, uh, the peels and the seeds can be thrown away because they were never edible to begin with, and therefore their kedusha does not require uh, achila. Uh, yeah. Uh, I could be wrong about this, but from what I understand is when Mashiach comes, there is no more like tshuva. Yeah. Um, if that's the case, then like, how does one wholeheartedly die to Mashiach if there's like, you know, like. I mean, first of all, a lot of like, not religious people, and then also like from a person could feel like, oh, you know, like, kind of want to like, set the clock, like, wholeheartedly. I think. Yeah. It's, it's, obviously, it's good, but 
Yeah, that, that's a very excellent question. And that is, you know, we all pray for Mashiach. We're all supposed to yearn for Mashiach. We're all supposed to want Mashiach. Question is, you know, why is that so? Uh, if we say that once Mashiach comes, you know, uh, you're not going to have the, necessarily the chance to do tshuva. You got to do it before Mashiach comes. So maybe I don't want Mashiach to come yet, uh, bo both in terms of people I care about who have not yet done tshuva, and in terms of me, there's stuff I got to do tshuva for, and, you know, I'm not ready. So Mashiach is not a kind of, a, you know, an uncontaminated blessing. There's going to be some hard aspects. So... I think the short answer is, in some ways, that praying for Mashiach is actually very altruistic. I am praying for the glory of God to be revealed in the world, even if it hurts me a little bit, because I'm not ready. I love Hashem so much, I want His glory to come to the world. Now, uh, by the way, uh, it's not quite true that you can't do tshuva when Mashiach comes. Certainly you can, but it'll be less significant because... When Hashem does all these miracles, then, you know, it's obvious you'll be inspired. And therefore, it doesn't count as much. That, that much is true. But it's not that the gates of tshuva are going to be closed. But as I say, one might look at Mashiach as altruism. I love Hashem, even if it's maybe not the best thing for me. And for the others. That we also and for the, even for the others. Even for the others. I, I, I want Hashem's glory to be revealed to the world. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so the problem is uh, the phenomenon that is known as uh, off the derech, or kids at risk, and this can happen at any age. This can happen in high school, this can happen in college, this can happen uh, even after that, in which a child might be not a, not, not a Baal Shuvah even. The child was raised in a from home, and the child went to yeshiva all of his life, and the child might even be in kolel, I'm aware of some cases. And uh, they go off the derech, they just stop believing, uh, and, and the like. Uh, and... It's not, I'm not going to say it's always the parent's fault. You know, it may not be anybody's fault. Things just happen. Uh, but the question is, are there things that parents can do that maybe reduce the risk of this happening? Not eliminate it, but reduce the risk. I, I think basically there's one fundamental thing that can be done. That mm -hmm. is, there has to be a feeling in the house of Tyra and mitzvahs as something that is joyous and not burdensome. Uh, far too often, even people who are from uh, they sometimes convey the idea of Judaism as very oppressive. Can't do this, can't do that, can't do that, can't think this, can't do that. And it takes out the joy and it takes out the simcha and it takes out the enthusiasm. And at some point, a kid might say, why do I have to suffer? Everyone else, everyone else is enjoying life. Everyone else is having a good time. Why can't I have a good time? Why can't I be like everybody else? Now, obviously, intellectually, there are a million answers you can give to that, right? Obviously, uh, there are many things you can say. But emotionally, a person says, why do I have to suffer all my life? So if we could find ways in our homes to create a Yiddish kind of simcha, that can make a real big difference. And I would say, in some ways, that's even more important than giving great and detailed philosophical answers to how do I know the Torah is from Hashem? You know, that's important. But, you know, people don't change their lives that much based on some philosophy, some long answer to prove that the Torah is minah shamayim. They say, oh, okay, that's nice, you know, I hear you. Uh, but people will live their lives based on what they feel is meaningful to them, what is fulfilling to them, what gives them simcha. So we have to create that atmosphere. And uh, sometimes uh, we're a little remiss. We're a little remiss at not creating a simcha in Torah and mitzvahs. Now, of course, the problem is that all parents face. Uh, you want to teach your kids a certain thing, you got to have it yourself. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Meaning, if you're not an Oved B'Simcha, then how are you going to teach your children to serve Hashem B'Simcha? So when we talk about what do I teach my children, we're also talking about what do you teach yourself? Right? What do you teach yourself? You have to be 
uh, your own Talmud in that way. Uh, yeah. Yeah. How do we reconcile with that in terms of the archaeological role and, and, and conflict with uh, the Torah uh, in terms of uh, remains Yeah, yeah, uh, th this was raised uh, last week, and you know, I, uh, it's tremendously disheartening. What, what can I say? Uh, this is uh, an absolutely despicable, deplorable desecration of holiness. This would be true even if this, the, they would have been like regular people. Uh, this would be a tremendously bad thing. And the fact that these were Chachamim and maybe members of the Sanhedrin uh, makes it so much worse. And one, one even wonders, what did these great, great Sadiqim do that Hashem would allow such a desecration to their bodies? What, what type of kapara is going on? I don't know. So all I can say is, I mean, I, 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 I said I, I would try to find out a little bit more about it. But uh, it's horrendous, and I'm sure. How many years ago was this, did you say? I think the, the tour guide told us um, it, was, it was somewhere between the 30s and the 50s when the modern Medina was born. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I think the laws are a little stricter now than they were then. I, I think it's less likely that this would happen. Also, the Haredi community is more active, so there would be more demonstrations uh, than perhaps there were. But this is awful. This is, this is something that's absolutely forbidden. According to halacha, not that they care, according to halacha, it was absolutely forbidden to do such a thing. And, it's, it's, and I think really it's, uh, okay, I'm not going to compare it to the Holocaust, but, but it is a, a crime against humanity, at least on a lower level. So I mean, it's a very, very serious thing. So I don't know. They don't know where the bodies are, is that right? They're, 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 that's my question. I don't know where they are. Right, right. I said I would try to find out. I didn't have a chance. Notes and, you know, after Passed on to the children, but they're like chicken scratch notes that are hard to read. And maybe so there's approval from the, the new reform state. There's there was, there, yeah. Not, um, yeah. So I don't. I don't so no, what can I say? You know, uh, it's like asking me, like, what is my opinion about mass murder? You know, I'm against it. <laughs> I mean, there's not a lot to say. It was an awful, awful thing to do. Very sad. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a two, two pronged question, but. Um, which did Rashi work on first, Talmud or Chumash? And then, why does Rashi switch from Aramaic and Hebrew in his, um, you know, in his comments? Yeah, which did he work on first? I, I believe Gemara was first. Uh, that, that's what I believe, but I'll, I'll try to verify it. Now, when you say switches from Aramaic to Hebrew, what, what are you referring to? In, in the Gemara or, or...? I guess, is, is the Chumash, is his commentary on Chumash all in Hebrew then? Or? The commentary in Chumash is, is Hebrew. It, it's Mishnaya Hebrew, so it's Rabbinic Hebrew. Okay. It's not Biblical Hebrew, but it's not Aramaic, no. no. But in the Gemara, he definitely switches between Aramaic and... Uh, not too Aramaic. much, not too much. Rashi's commentary on Gemara is also uh, largely Hebrew. I mean, the Aramaic is the Gemara. In other words, Rashi will bring the words of the Gemara and then explain them. Okay. So the Aramaic component will be the words of the Gemara, usually. Now, the exception would be that sometimes a klal, a, a well-known principle, is known in the Aramaic more than the Hebrew. So Rashi may refer to principles of Shas in Aramaic because that's how, we, that's how we know them. Unlike the Rambam, by the way. The Rambam meticulously, and sometimes it's awkward, the Rambam meticulously translates into Hebrew every Aramaic expression in the Gemara. Which means the Rambam like, makes up kind of awkward phraseologies which are not familiar, to, I mean, other than one who learns the Rambam because the Rambam does not want to use any, I believe in the whole Mishnah Torah, Somehow, I think two words escaped, escaped his translation, that uh, he used two Aramaic words in the whole Mishnah Torah. <laughs> the Mishnah Torah is 99.9999% Hebrew, and every Aramaic klal of the Gemara is translated into Hebrew. But Rashi didn't go that way. I think Rashi was using the more familiar, so that would be the key, where, where the Aramaic klal is the familiar way we refer to things. So Rashi will use that familiar language. I think that's what's going on. Yeah. This question was sent in. Um, 
Ruben suggested by, that, that most of the Gedolim were, quote, non-conformists. Is that accurate? And <laughs> what does this mean in a system that thrives on conformity? I'm sorry, say, say the end, end of the question. Yeah. Uh, what does this mean in a system that thrives on conformity? Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's, in other words, were most of the Gedolim non-conformist? And what does that say for a system that uh, requires conformity? Excellent, excellent question. We're, we're running late. I guess I could excuse myself. We're running out of time. Uh, basically, most Gedolim were non-conformist, but that's the nature of greatness, and that's the nature of genius, that by definition, you cannot be put into a box. However, the problem is that uh, conformity is something that most people need to a certain degree because uh, if they're simply given unstructured time and they're not told what to do with the time, they won't necessarily know how to fill it. So they need a certain structure, a certain predictability. When you're very great, you can go on your own in some ways. Uh, so that's part of it. Now, it is very, very true that yeshiva culture uh, over the past uh, really since the Holocaust, since after the Holocaust, has become progressively more conformist. If you go back to the so-called golden age, Slobodka, Mir, Kamenets, you know, in Europe, the famous, famous European yeshivas, you will find a lot of individuality, a lot of creativity. People dress differently. Not everybody wore black and white uh, clothes. Uh, people wore colored shirts and striped suits and different things. Uh, the notion that people are supposed to dress the same and think the same that's kind of a post-Holocaust to recover from the trauma we wanted to create, a strong, unified community. But it wasn't, it's not necessarily the best thing. And I think that people need to be in touch with their creative side. But on the other hand, we also need structure, meaning the, the, actual, the Godot may be able to create his own type of life. Most of us need some more guidance, I think. That's kind of what's going on. Um, okay, All right, but, uh, be well and take care.